morning. My name is Brad Olson. I'm the head Jesus follower here, and welcome to worship at Loveland United Methodist Church. If things feel a little bit different today, it's not just you. Things are a little bit different. One reason for that is that usually we have two services, a more traditional service at 9 o'clock and then a more contemporary service at 1030. Today we're doing one combined service, and then we're going to have a state of the church meeting at 1030. So I'm hoping that you'll all stick around for that. We're going to talk about some of the um, financial and other issues that, are, um, that we're dealing with as a church. And so I appreciate your input into that, and I'm looking forward to how that conversation goes. We're also doing this service, we're winding up a series that we've been doing, a call to prayer, and so we're going to focus on, we're focusing on what the letters of the word prayer might remind us to do in our time of prayer, and we're on why. We're going to focus on a time to yield, yield. One of the ways that um, Don and I, you may know that uh, about a week or so, the week before last, my wife and I were on vacation in Ireland, and one of the ways that we like to travel is to find a place and basically camp out there for our vacation. On this particular vacation, we left a couple of days where we didn't have anything planned, so we could basically do anything. But we realized as we got to those couple of days that we didn't know what we were going to do. This is one of the ways that we leave time or leave some space to yield. If you Google Ireland, probably the picture that will come up is a place called the Cliffs of Moher. So we had just seen the Cliffs of Moher on a boat ride. We didn't know what we were going to do the next day, and so we asked the guy that was leading the boat ride, what would you do if you had a day free in Ireland? And he said, oh, I'd go up to um, Calamora, and I'd see the, there's a national park up there. And so you know what we did that next day? Went up to Kyle Mora, we saw the Kyle Mora Abbey and had an absolutely spectacular day. How do we leave room in our life to yield to what God's calling us to do and God's will for our lives? The other thing you ought to know that's different about today is it's World Communion Sunday. We're gathering together with people from all over the world, all different traditions, to do one thing that holds us in common, and that is gather around the Lord's table and celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. It's good to be able to worship with you this morning. There's some other things we thought you ought to be aware of in the life of our church, and to highlight a couple of those, I'm going to turn things over to Lisa. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> if you'll open your bulletin this morning, I want to draw your attention to the LUMC connection card. We would love it if you would fill this out and let us know that you are here. There's a spot on the back for prayer request if you have any of those. And you can leave this in the offering box by the front door when you leave. And we'll have all the information we need to know that you are here today. Got a lot going on this week. Um, first of all, I want to give you an update from the Festival of Sharing. Our church um, put together 45 bags of food and supplies for the Life Food Pantry. So they send us a very big thank you because that really helps their um, shelves get restocked for the beginning of the holiday season. Um, secondly, you have a blue little flyer in your bulletin today. This is week number four of the All Church Study, the prayer course. This is your study guide for week four. I was on Facebook this past week giving a little recap of what we've done so far. I hope you're all digging into this. It's a really good study. <clears throat> Thirdly, the United Methodist women are meeting Thursday, October 6th at 10 a.m. There's information um, for that in the bulletin. And um, the Interfaith Hospitality Network is in need of some volunteer help. And you can see Ken Spiker about that. They have changed their name to the um, Found House, and there's information in the happenings, and I think Ken will probably be around after the service if you have any questions on how to get involved. And then the Crafty Chicks, um, look like they're meeting on Thursday, October 6th. More information about that. And then finally, Trunk or Treat is coming up. I cannot believe we're in October already. And there's information in the bulletin, but you can always see Sharon for more information on how to donate um, with that. We're accepting donations this year to help with um, the budget, and it's going to be a great event. <clears throat> 
All right. This morning's call to worship is interactive. You can see the words behind me on the screen, but if you don't want to do that, they're in your bulletin. It's from Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you are upright in heart. And this is the word of the Lord. And if you'll please stand, we'll all sing together. What are some of those wonderful, beautiful words? Well, I'd like to invite you to join together with me in affirming our faith with these words from 1 Timothy. They're either on the screen or printed in your bulletin. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen.
Thank you, choir. We are people who remember, and one thing we remember is to pray, and so I'd like to invite you to join together with me in prayer, in our congregational prayer. Let us pray. Thanks be to thee, O Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits which you hast given us, for all the pains and insults that thou hast borne for us, O merciful Redeemer, friend and brother. May we know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly, for thine own sake. Amen. Good morning, my name is Bill, and our first scripture reading is Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much, preserved my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to our children's moment. My name is Sharon. Normally at 1030, we'd have the kids that are here come up to the front row, but you can stay where you are for right now because we won't be going to Sunday school this service. However, you all get to participate this morning. So if you're able, I need everyone to please stand up. Okay. So just follow the following questions. If you happen to be six foot two or over, please sit down. If you happen to be five foot three or under, please sit down. Okay? If you happen to be wearing black shoes, please sit down. Everyone's looking. Am I wearing black shoes? <laughs> if you happen to be wearing glasses, please sit down. Congratulations, the rest of you. You are who Jesus loves the most. You can have a seat. Of course that's not true. Of course that's not true. We know that God loves everyone equally. But in our Sunday school lesson today, we're going to be learning about Peter, who had been one of his disciples, who gets a vision from God telling him, that the good news of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit is for everyone because at that point, they didn't think that was the case. Now, for us, we may not ever have the opportunity to go far, far away and bring the gospel to people who have never heard about Jesus. But just because people live far away from us isn't the only way a person can be far away from Jesus. Someone right next to us can be very far from Jesus and we could travel the same as going thousands of miles as if we just share the love of Jesus with them. So just remember, wherever you are, if you bring God and Jesus and the, and the message of the Holy Spirit to anybody in your life, anybody that God brings across your path, it's the same as traveling to a faraway place because you've brought something to them that they didn't know how to find. So good for you on doing that and know that you're called to do that you can do that, and that is the promise of the gospel. And with that, I'm going to ask you to stand again and greet your neighbor and pass the peace. Good morning. 
good to worship with you this morning. Thank you, band. We have Rob and Pax on percussion today. Uh, I'd like to invite you to remain standing while we sing together, but please worship however you're comfortable. together.
You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Ken. I'm one of the over six feet two. <laughs> I'm also the Ken of uh, Found House, and I'll be at a table out there. Don't let the five to nine scare you. We, uh, not everybody's staying from five to nine, a few of us, in fact. So the second scripture today is found uh, in Matthew chapters four, verses one to 11. Then Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Ken. Today we are winding up a call to prayer. I've been challenging you to every day this week pray, Come Holy Spirit, fill my heart with more of you. And to kind of guide our time as of prayer, we've been looking not only at the word prayer as something that we do, but also as an acronym that reminds us how to be intentional about the time that we spend in prayer. I've been suggesting that the P can be used to remind us to praise, praise God for who he is, the blessings in our life. The R can remind us to repent. We all have things we ought to be working on, changes we ought to be making. The A can remind us to ask. We can ask anything of the Lord. And today we get to the last letter of the word pray, which is Y which is a reminder to us to yield, to yield. Always to leave enough room in our prayers to yield to the will of God, to yield. Have you had any experiences recently with yielding? Here's my yielding story. As I said at the beginning of the service, my wife and I just got back the week before last from Ireland. It was an amazing experience if you ever have the chance to go. I'd take it. However, there were some rather terrifying moments. I've already said that the way that we like to travel is we like to find a place and we like to spend most of our time there and then we like to take little day trips out from that, that place. And in this case, it meant that we had to rent a car. Now, renting a car, car is not a real big deal except that in Ireland, they put the steering wheel on the right side of the car. So for the last couple months, I've been imagining myself sitting on the other side of the car, and then the cars drive on the left side of the road. We almost didn't go because I wouldn't, wasn't sure I could really handle it, but then we had dinner with Catherine and Matt Holcomb, and they said, oh, it's no problem. You'll pick this up real easily. And then we went to rent a car, and we found out that most of the cars that you rent are manual transmission, and so the, trans the stick shift is on the left side of the driver, but I'm left-handed, so I thought, all right, I can handle that. And then I found out that most of the intersections in Ireland are not intersections, they're roundabouts. I'm really glad that they put the roundabout here and up on South Lebanon Road because I've been practicing on that for the last five years. So I thought, all right, and I did pretty well until like the end of the week. And here's my yield story. Then I realized that when people have gotten really comfortable with roundabouts, they put lanes in the roundabouts. So you have to decide which lane you're going to go around the circle in, and they go clockwise around instead of counterclockwise around. 
so that you're able to get out on the exit that you want to exit with. So we're entering this three-lane roundabout. And I'm going for the third exit on the roundabout, and I'm trying to decide whether to get in the first lane of the roundabout or the second lane or the third lane of the roundabout. And I'm inching my way in, deciding whether I really want to try this or not, and I'm sure I'm annoying the people behind me. And Dawn picks up on that, and she turns to me, you know, the sign says yield, not give up. The sign says yield, not give up. Usually she was very encouraging, but on this moment, all right, time that you just got to jump. Which I think brings me to an important point about yielding. There's a difference between yielding and giving up. Just because you're yielding doesn't mean you're quitting. It doesn't mean you're giving in. It means you're aware that there are other factors at work, and sometimes it's a good idea to proceed with caution. And as I was thinking about yielding, here's another thought that came to mind, and that is that in order to yield, you have to have some sense of where you're going, don't you? You have to know that you're going somewhere, that you're headed in some direction. Now, since we're in church on Sunday morning, I can ask the ultimate question, do you know where you're going? When we get to this end of this world, do we know where our soul is going to spend eternity? That's a good question to ponder, isn't it? But in a more temporal sense, we could also ask the question of, even in this life, do you know where you're headed? What are your goals? And since our goal as Christians is to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we might ask the question of, what is the goal of being a disciple? Have you ever one, known somebody who you would really describe as a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ? What are some of the qualities that made them a fully, that distinguish them as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ? Here's a question you might ponder. If you were in a restaurant and there were some people in a booth next to you and they were talking about you, what one word would you hope that they would use? Here's a word that's not too bad a word. Yielded or surrendered. There's a guy by the name of M. R. Scott Peck. Does that name ring a bell to you? It may be familiar to you because he wrote a book called um, The Road Less Traveled. Not the poem by Robert Browning, but kind of a classic book about the poem or based on the poem. He also went on to do some work on how Christians mature in their discipleship. And he suggested that the way that we do mature in our discipleship kind of parallels the way that people tend to progress into adulthood. So he suggested that as we grow, we start out in a kind of chaotic phase. This would be like the three-year-old phase. Have you ever seen a three-year-old? I think he's right that you describe that phase well as being kind of chaotic. If you build something with blocks and you have a three-year-old in the room, what's going to happen pretty soon? They're all going to be gone, aren't they? You let a three-year-old loose in a room and everything may be perfectly organized and in place, and it takes, what, maybe two or three minutes, and the whole place is chaos. He suggests that often that's the way that our faith journey begins, that we come to know Jesus Christ and our whole world is upended. We come to see things in a new way and we tend to question the way that we had been doing things and it's a kind of a chaotic time. And then he suggests that we move into a more formal or institutional time where we realize that there are some patterns, there are some things that we can count on and so we come to love to learn. We ask questions. And that that's true in our discipleship also. Then we come to understand the importance of the laws of Moses. And we come to understand the patterns in Scripture. And we tend to want to learn about what the Bible's all about. And then we enter those teenage years. <laughs> and we come, he calls this the skeptical phase, where we question everything. And we wonder whether what, what we've been learning really, where the boundaries are, where the limits are, how far you can push it. We tend to do that in our faith. And what is the ultimate goal then? This is where I'm trying to get to. The ultimate goal is what he calls a mystical phase, where we appreciate paradox. We come to be at peace with paradox. We realize that there are some things which seem to be contradictory but are both true, and we come to find a peace with that. And I would call that a place of surrender, where we're at peace with letting God be God and trying to figure out how we fit into that, or completely yielded. 
Now, we're talking about prayer, so isn't it true that in our time of prayer, if we don't have some room to let God's will and all we're doing is telling God what we think we need for our life, then that's probably not real helpful prayer. In fact, we might be doing more damage than good. But yes, our prayers ought to be persistent and they ought to be bold, but they ought to have enough humility also to leave room for the will of God. All right, so where do we see that in Jesus' life? I'd like to suggest that we see that in Jesus' life when he spends time driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness where he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. You just heard this story read. Before I get into the, the three specific temptations, though, I thought I ought to note that did you notice how each one of the temptations started, that the devil started out with? Started out by saying, if you are the will of God, or if you are the Son of God, or in other words, the basic temptation that the devil is trying to present to Jesus is the temptation to be somebody other than who God had created him to be. All right, now what are the specific temptations? Do you remember the first one? If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Which makes me wonder, and then Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Which makes me wonder, what's so wrong with bread, right? We've all eaten it. It's not like some of the bad things that I eat. What's so wrong with bread? And we know that Jesus could have made bread because remember there was a time where Jesus was teaching on a hillside. Thousands of people, 5,000 people were gathering to hear him teach. And they were so intrigued with what he was saying that they stayed even through the dinner hour. And then the disciples come to him and they realize that the followers, the people who are listening are getting hungry. And so they have a problem. People are hungry. The disciples saw the problem, but what does Jesus see? Jesus sees the solution. He sees a kid who has a couple of loaves of bread and some fish. And so what does Jesus do? He multiplies the loaves and the fish and so everybody has enough to eat and there are even leftovers. So we, we know that Jesus could have turned the rocks into bread. And we even know that Jesus apparently likes bread. In just a moment, we're gather, going to gather around the Lord's table and we're going to remember that on the day where Jesus was arrested, he took what? Bread. He blessed it and broke it and then used it to symbolize his body broken. So it could be so important that it is the way that we remember him. All right, so I got to thinking about this question. What is it about bread that is so wrong that the devil tempts Jesus with? And here's what I think. Jesus was not starving in the wilderness. Jesus was fasting in the wilderness. So this was not that he wasn't able to have, he wasn't dying of starvation. He was choosing to be in the wilderness, to be hungry. Or in other words, what the devil was tempting him with is to use his gifts for his own selfish ambition instead of to help others. To be the son of God only for his own gain instead of to take away the sins of the world. To be the son of God. Here's another question that I pondered as I thought about this story of the devil tempting Jesus. And that is, when do you think the devil showed up in those 40 days? Do you think he started, came in the beginning of those 40 days? Or do you think it was in the middle of the 40 days? Or do you think it was at the end of the 40 days? Or do you think it was all the way through? And I ask that question because sometimes I wonder, when do you find yourself most tempted? Is it when you're starting something out? And you think, oh, I can let this go till tomorrow. Or is it in the middle where you wonder, is this really worth keeping doing? Or is it the end? Do you think maybe the devil said, eh, 39, that's close enough. The temptation, I think, to not yield, to not yield, to the temptation to use our gifts for our own selfish ambition, to always think about others, and to be concerned about what God's will is for our life. All right, the second temptation that the devil came to Jesus with is the question of, he took him to the top of the temple in Jerusalem, and he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down and command the angels to come and lift you up. And Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Or in other words, the temptation seems to be to use God's power to make ourselves safe. Boy, there's a temptation, isn't it? 
Because don't we all like to be safe? There's a story about um, the Apostle Paul when he was in Malta in the 28th chapter of the book of Acts where he was bitten by a snake. No harm came from him. So apparently God's, God's power can protect us. But does that mean that Paul went out looking for other snakes to get bit by to show the power of God? No. There's also a legend about um, um, St. Augustine's mother, a woman by the name of Monica. The story is that St. Augustine was scheduled to travel to Rome, and she didn't think that he ought to go to Rome. At this point, Augustine wasn't a believer, and so she was afraid that if he went to Rome, he would be fall under bad influences. And so she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed that her son would not go to Rome. And do you know what her son did? He went to Rome anyway. When he was in Rome, though, he met a person named Ambrose and came really interested in Ambrose's teaching. Now, Ambrose was a Christian. Ambrose was a bishop in the church. And when he came back, he had decided to become a believer, to become a Christian himself. So sometimes we do need to take that leap. Sometimes we do need to take the risk. Which brings me to the last temptation. The devil says to Jesus, he says, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will only serve me. And Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's a temptation, isn't it? The temptation, I think, is to, 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 you, to, to pursue power and privilege instead of pursuing the will of God for our life. When I think of somebody who struggled with that, I also think of the story of Samson in the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Samson? I have to admit, you'd think somebody who likes to lift weights would spend more time in the book of Sam or looking at Samson. So I went back and I visited the book of Samson, or the, the story of Samson. And here is the basic story. Samson is married to a woman named Delilah, and Delilah is not a real good person. Samson is a very strong, godly person, and she's trying to figure out what is the source of his strength? You remember this story, right? He says, if you take some bow strings and tie me up, then I won't be able to get out. That's the source of my strength. So you don't know what she does? She takes some bow strings and ties him up. Now you'd think at that point he would have learned, time to stop sharing with this lady. But no, she says, he breaks the, the bow strings, and so then he goes, she goes back to him again and says, all right, that wasn't it, obviously, and so tell me, what is the source of your strength? And he says, well, if you tie me up with really strong ropes, then I won't be able to get out. Next thing he knows, he finds himself tied up with really strong ropes. Again, you'd think he'd learn at this point, but no. And then he says, if you braid my hair, then I will lose my strength. What does she do? She braids his hair three times. Samson should have learned by this point. Then she gives him the argument that he could not find a way to get around. Do you remember what this argument was? She says to him, if you love me, you will tell me what the source of your strength is. That one he couldn't. He says, the source of my strength is my hair. And then that's why... Delilah has come to be known as a hair cutter. That was the source of her strength. My point is, when we go for power or privilege or control instead of the will of God, even if it's at the of love, we are losing out. We are yielding to the temptation of the devil. All right, so what are some applications that we might learn from this? Well, one is, um, consider having a prayer verse or consider having a line, a verse from Scripture that kind of guides you. I try to do this every year, to have a verse that guides me through the year. My verse this year is you are saved by grace through faith, and so I'm trying to be more graceful to myself. Another is prayer. Be persistent. Be bold in your prayers. That's why we're doing this call to prayer. And another is trust that God can work even in the most difficult of situations. All right, I'll share with you one last Ireland story. We um, struggled with the question of what souvenirs do you bring back from Ireland? And this is my wife's cherished souvenir that she bought, brought back from Ireland. 
Have you ever heard of Balik pottery before? We have one that was my grandmother's, and she likes it so much, she wanted to get another one to match it. So this is, and so I got curious, what's the story of Balik pottery? And here's the story, no, I probably better not do that. <laughs> here's the story of Balik pottery. You probably know that a part of Irish history is that they had a famine back in the middle 1800s, 1846 to 1851 didn't rain for years, and so their potato crops were all lost. A third of Ireland left the country or died. There was a person by the name of John Bloomingfield who lived at um, Hartway Castle, and his problem was, what do we do? How do we keep this castle running? He noticed that in the town of Balik, not too far away, they had beautiful homes that were all caked with this beautiful white coating. And so he got to wondering, what is that? Can you imagine a whole town that looks like that? I've been wondering whether it really does. What he did is he found that there was a clay that had a, was a very fine clay that when it was fired in a kill, it created a very um, white, iridescent kind of finish. And so he started making pottery. And now they are a multi-million dollar business that people like me, when we go to Ireland, want to bring back a gift from. And my point is that when we yield to God's will and God's power in our life, there is no telling the way that God can work. And so as we gather around the Lord's table, I'd like to invite you to see this as a time to do just that, to listen for what God's will is for your life and look for ways that you can yield to God's will in your life. A number of years ago, there was an effort to try to recapture what, the, um, what Holy Communion might have looked like in the first century. And the best guess that we have, now this probably would have been in Latin or Greek, is that it might have gone something like this. And it would have started out with a greeting. It started out by saying, the Lord be with you. And then lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered together with his disciples. And we know that during that meal, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Towards the end of that meal, Jesus took a cup. Again, he gave thanks to God. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. I'd like to invite you to join with me in a time of prayer. And as part of this prayer, I'd like to offer a prayer that I found in a person named Glenn Martin's book, Beyond the Rat Race. I'd also like to invite you to especially pray for the Klemp family this morning. Um, you may not have heard, but one of the great dear saints of this church, Bob Klemp, passed away late Friday evening. So that you're all fully informed, the plans are being made to celebrate his life at a service here in this sanctuary on Friday at 11 o'clock. The visitation will be at Tufts um, on Thursday evening between 6 and 8. He's put up a good fight, um, and now he's won that fight, and he is in the fullness of God's glory. Will you join with me in prayer? Let us pray. 
Well, holy and gracious God, we thank you for this privilege to gather together with people around this country and around the world at the Lord's table. Celebrate your sacrifice and your gift of grace to us. As we gather this morning, we especially remember Doug Dowson in our prayers. He has spent some of this week in the hospital. And for Sylvia Wilson, who had surgery on Thursday. Doctors were very pleased with the results of the surgery, so we pray now that you'll be with her through her recovery, that her recovery might com be complete. And we pray for Bob Klimp, who leaves this world that we know and now goes to join you in the fullness of your glory. We pray that you will give him peace and that you will give him joy and that you'll be with Mildred as she goes through what I know is a very difficult time. Lord Jesus, I've been in control of my life, but now I want your spirit to be the one who runs my life. I'm giving you all of my rights. Please take control of every area of my life. Whenever I am tempted to take back control, please point out to me and help me to have the courage and strength to resist successfully the temptation or desire to take control back again. Show me how to live on top of my circumstances and not under them. Help me to keep my eyes on you, Lord Jesus, instead of on my problems. Let me see you, Father, as the one who can and will meet every need of my life. Let me be sufficient in you and not in my own abilities and strengths. Help me to have the right balance between living in your control and exercising diligence as I respond to each facet of my life. And whenever pressures come that may have been unbearable or de de debilitating, Show me your perspective, anything I've been doing wrong or thinking improperly. Then show me how to correct my faulty actions and thoughts so that I can continue to walk in your spirit's control. Thank you that you do not want these things in my life, that you want these things in my life even more than I do and remind me that when my faith gets weak, you are there through your spirit. And so we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on each one of us who is gathered here this morning and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the very body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. And so, in the, with the confidence of the children of God, we join together in the prayer we know as the Lord's Prayer. Will you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are some who have agreed to help in the serving of this meal. I'd like to invite you to join with me now. Check the body and blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. You can, and I know this is a horrible simplification, but summarize that there are some things we do for God and some things God does for us. We call Holy Communion a sacrament because this is one of those things where we remember what God does for us. It doesn't depend on us. This is because of who God is and what God does, which is why in the United Methodist Church we practice an open table, which means anybody, wherever you are in your faith journey, is welcome to receive these signs of God's grace. They are transformational. If you would like the um, absolutely COVID safe version, we have these prepackaged versions. There's a wafer at the very top. You can choose to pick up one of these and then take the elements in your, in your pew. Otherwise, you can take a little piece of bread and then dip it in the juice and take 
those signs together. All right, the meal is ready, the table's prepared. I invite you to come as you will to receive these signs of God's grace. player in this next one, so I'm making sure that she's ready. Will you stand and join together with me in singing our next hymn, O Lord, May Church and Home Combine.
a story in the Old Testament about a widow who lived in a place called Zarephath who was very poor and was fixing the last little bit of food that she had to serve her son. And then Elijah, the prophet, comes along and asks, would you be willing to share a little bit of that with me? And Elijah did. And because of that, the jar that she used to make the food with never went dry. The oil that she was using to light the lamp also never ran out. I'd like to give you the opportunity to be that generous. There is an offering box just to the left of the door as you leave. Your financial gifts are very much appreciated. Um, there also is a button on our website, lovelandumc.org, where you can give electronically. Another of the prophets asks a really good question. Ask the question, what must I do if I want to be faithful? And then he hears the Lord answer, if you want to be faithful, here's what you do. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with the Lord. Stay safe and be well. coffee or some refreshments to serve the Lord, or, um, but I hope you'll all be here at 1030 so we can continue in our state of the church meeting. Go in peace to serve the Lord. <laughs>